Hello, and welcome to episode 73 of Pros, the very first episode of 2019. This week, see an artist come to life, dance into deification, and look to hope for the future in a burned out husk of a world. To begin 2019, I am putting forward three flash fiction stories written for three students of a recent online graphic novels in the literary tradition course, and inspired by their backgrounds of where they simulcast with me for our live class meetings online. This triple threat harkens back to the beginnings of the show, and I am very excited to share them with you. Also, Ben, Lily, Julia, I'm fulfilling my promise. I'm hopeful that you all enjoy your pieces. To begin 2019, I will beg of you all to go and follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Even more amazing would be if you could head over to Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, and leave a rating and or review for pros. Ratings and reviews are what really help prop the show up and allow me to continue into the future. For easiest access to the show, subscribe using Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or whatever podcast catcher is your favorite. Forget to buy someone a gift for the holidays? Well, maybe you could also do the show a major solid and recommend it to family and friends that might enjoy it. They'll get the gift of pros, and the show will get that wonderful addition to the community. Man, I'd be appreciative of it, too. Thanks for listening. Let's get to the tale, shall we? This week we have the stark brick wall, embraced by the universe, and the fall of Eden. Enjoy. The Stark Brick Wall, an original short story by Jared I. McGee. The walls were white. They were chunky brick with a thin veneer of whitewash slopped all over it. Stefan's world was full of color every single moment of every single day, so staring at that neutral wall was a space of sanity and solace for him. Vibrancy and energy can burn one out, after all, and this was his way of ensuring his creativity and overall mental well-being didn't go down in flames. That neutral place was one of refuge. However, today had been quite the day. His peers at Pratt had praised his work at the gallery opening. His professors had applauded him, going so far as to put their flutes of cheap champagne down to literally clap at a boy his back and self-congratulatingly shake one another's hands. The critics that were present ooed and awed and generally bowed down before his various paintings and mixed media pieces. They promised him a stellar write-up in their various citywide publications. And though that sounded a bit myopic and small, New York City's citywide art conversation really was the entire nation's at this point. Today had been quite the day. The vibrancy that hummed through Stefan's head did, of course, spill out onto the canvases he labored over for most of his days. That hum became an ever-present buzz all day, every day. And now, that buzz was a roaring cacophony. Applause mingled with sycophantic well-wishing, mingling with questions about his method and his motivation and his meanings, cocktailed with the clink of glasses and the slurping of shrimp cocktail, stirred around and magnified by a thousand pretentious side conversations grasping at the depth and breadth of the various works present at the gallery that particular evening. A cascade of sound and color. This is what Stefan's head was like every day since he first became self-aware. Here amid all these people, though, what most people called his artistic flair, or his indie eccentricities, had taken on breath and were bounding throughout the muted lights from sconces and candles. Stefan quickly realized that he was not, as he'd so often thought since childhood, absolutely insane. Colors did come to life. Colors did become sound. Colors were ambulatory under the right conditions. Not only that, but he was intelligent, or at least relatively so. He thought himself stupid for so long, and after so many people telling him so, that this shift in his reality was almost too much to bear. 
Today had been quite the day. Stefan had met more people in one three-hour period than he had throughout all of high school and his undergraduate career combined. Moreover, all the people he had met were actually clamoring to speak with him. He wasn't shyly making his way from corner to corner, praying not to be noticed. No, he was front and center in the gallery's main hall, and the ebb and flow of waves of onlookers took him wherever that tide was headed, always ensuring it didn't lose its grasp on the boy. Sometimes, the pull was gentle. But more often, it was a riptide that threatened to take Stefan under and never allow him up for breath, causing him to fear for himself. Even in the thinking it, Stefan knew that thought to be overdramatic. But he really was being overwhelmed by all the attention, and that it was all wholly positive made the experience all the more like drowning for him. From time to time, he would come up for metaphorical air, by sipping the champagne that his praisers would now not allow to become fully empty or by nibbling fancy crumbling cheeses that never fully disappeared from his plate. That bought him a little time between the adulation and the explanations. Women fawned over him. Men seemed to adore him. Everyone wanted to know what he was up to tomorrow night. If he was dating someone, who he might be willing to go home with tonight. His head spanned from champagne and the sheer possibilities for a future that he could have never imagined, even earlier this evening when he was awkwardly putting on his rented tux in front of his milky, hazy mirror back in his studio apartment in Brooklyn. Today had been quite the day. All that color, all that spice that made up what most artists yelled from their elevated planes of existence was the true meaning of this brief existence of ours. But now... Stefan was staring at his plain white walls. As always, the scene quieted his busy mind and calmed his pounding heart. It allowed his anxieties to go from unignorable thrumming drum to negligent but insistent whisper that was very nearly inaudible to his mind's ear. After this evening where life had come forth in all its unadulterated glory, tossing the entire range of its palette at him, Stefan was beginning to think that this brick-layered reset button might not be necessary. He'd survived a major gallery opening. His work was the talk of the town he was Apollo reborn. In that light, this blank canvas was both an affront and an inspiration. Suddenly, in this moment of triumph, he saw those white bricks as more canvas than refuge. Stefan lurched up from where he was sitting on his love seat and careened toward his paints. In a fever that only artists can understand, Stefan began to create on that battle wall. He haphazardly splashed colors. He lovingly caressed with colors. He let the divine work through his hands and his brush and his cresting energies to attack that now mocking blankness. After two hours of sweating, and frenetic artistic expression. Stefan sat back down in his love seat, throwing caution to the wind by not putting down a tarp after his session. Rather than looking up at a blank canvas, Stefan now saw the vibrancy and almost painful contrasts of neon and pastel and reds and greens and every electric color that he could fit into that small space. The scene seemed to be a garden of sorts. His very own garden of Eden, a place of creation and humanity and perfection. A place where he could be his very own god and keep perfect against desecration, even if the occasional snake did slither in only to be tossed out. He was the master of this place, and he was the master of his life outside those windows now, too. Today had been quite the day. Stefan leaned back, staying upright but slouched on his love seat, falling asleep there in front of his chock-a-block Nouveau Eden and covered in the paints he used to create it. Embraced by the Universe An original short story by Jared I. McGee 
Sitar music wriggled and shimmied its way through the beaded entranceways and beyond the hanging tapestries. Those tinny but harmonious notes lively curled around the clouds of incense smoke that inundated the air of the small chamber of the temple, just like it did all the rooms there. The acolytes of Nasparana always kept the music going and the incense burning, never allowing their goddess to have any room to take exception to their actions. After all, Nasparana was equal parts graceful dancer and horrific destroyer of worlds. That is probably what drew Lyda Rose to the worship of this strange but wonderful goddess in the first place. The sensual nature of the dance was, of course, largely appealing to anyone, particularly a young woman who adored the art form for art's sake. Add an exercise, the attention it garnered, and the praise that came along with being one of the greatest dancers in the region, and Lyda Rose could almost not avoid leaning ever toward her talent as her passion, her passion as her career her career as her calling. But the world of the dancer was often one that was a bit too superficial for her. Eating disorders and makeup, pats on the head and being called cute or pretty, those just did not appeal to her, nor did they accurately reflect the power and all but fanatical devotion it took to grow and become the type of dancer she'd become. So, when Lyda Rose, after years of study and searching, had come across the old tomes that spoke of the goddess whose dance made hearts swell and quake, well, that was a story she had to investigate. What she wouldn't give for a healthy measure of respect with a dollop of worshipful awe and a dash of fear. As she moved forward in her search for a way of communicating with the ancient figure, Lyda Rose learned that the figure of Apasmara, a forgetful, dopey, utterly dim-witted dwarf upon which Nasparana danced eternally. Apasmara was meant to be representative of the self-same ignorance that took the shape of those eating disorders, all that makeup, the diminutive pats on the head, and all the sidelong, infantilizing, yet sexualizing compliments that flooded Lyda Rose and her compatriots before, during, and after their performances. The goddesses grinding that ignorance underfoot was appealing to her, and it seemed to be a divine message that Lyda Rose was on the right track to enlightenment and fulfillment of meeting this goddess in life. She also learned of Nasparana's powerful Lyasa, the dance that called the gods and goddesses from across the cosmos together on Mount Kalish to determine every fate of every being that ever was, ever is, ever would be. The goddess would move and gyrate and vibrate to the sound of divine instruments played by her colleagues already present, ensuring that the most powerful beings in creation could not resist the assemblage, the prospect of missing her dance being just too heartbreaking to consider. She learned of Nasparana's other aspects as well. The goddess carried flames, wore skulls, bore a horrifying face of aggression and anger at times. This embodiment of dance and grace was also a source of fear for those that did not choose to show the correct respect. Death and grace as one. Sensuality and fear coalesced. Lyda Rose's reality? Become a worshipped goddess. Most importantly, Lyda Rose learned that, for almost all of human history, Nasparana had been depicted incorrectly. Somewhere around the time that agriculture first came into being, the sensual goddess of the dance and of destruction was masculinized, made male, to strip away the power and influence of the priestesses of the world, of women who had ruled humanity since the earliest shuddering into reality. Creation and destruction in the hands of women, not men? Birth and death in the hands of women, not men? Morality and sexuality in the hands of women, not men? All of this seemed a far cry from the experiences Lyda Rose had had thus far in her own life. But in Nesperana, she found these long dormant powers in herself and began to reclaim those aspects of femininity and womanhood that had been so long repressed and forgotten. And now, there in her chamber of the Temple of Kimlir, 
her current home away from the world that wanted her back as their entertainer. Their pretty girl, their dancing fool. There amid the sitars pining and the beads clicking and the incense's incessant haze, Lida Rose made yet another discovery as she combed through ancient texts that had so long been forgotten. More dancers. More goddesses. More aspects of the divine from more cultures and times that chose dance as their means of power, all of whom were women. To Piscore of Greece, the muse whose dance inspired all art and song in the Western world. Amno Usume no Mikoto of Japan, who danced the sun into being and the underworld into submission, imbuing her dances with humor and goodwill while still embracing her feminine power, dancing half nude and embodying independence and dominance. Mera of Kimer, an Aspara of the first order that danced the stars and planets into their celestial places and created half the terrestrial realm while doing so. And the list went on and on and on. Lida Rose closed her books and lit her own personal scented oils, foregoing the addition of even more simple incense to her beloved dancing feminine divine of so many names. She laid down her floor mat before she began meditating after all her scholarly adventure of the day. She beamed as she looked around the chamber at the varied pink and fuchsia tapestries hanging on the otherwise stark walls. They reminded her of the tie-dye of her youth. Even this backdrop made her feel powerful as a dancer and as a woman. The color that radiated from these tapestries was the same as the energy she now saw wreathing dancers mid-performance. Rather than chant or sit cross-legged to pray, Lida Rose began to sway and contort her nimble body, beginning what would be an hours-long meditative dance. Lissome and supple, strong and unyielding, nurturing and terrified, her dance began and would continue as she continued to seek her true and powerful place in the universe. Before we get started on this story, I just thought it worthy of note that, after just about two years, maybe a little less, with this small, short piece of flash fiction, prose is officially hitting its 200th short story. Now, that's probably not entirely true, because the way I count short stories is a bit strange sometimes. I'm pretty sure we made this number a while back. However, in my most recent numbering system, this indeed is Short Story 200. Please enjoy The Fall of Eden, an original short story by me, Jared I. McGee. Sintana could barely remember the call of the Perioles. The beautiful emerald green, deep gold, and sultry periwinkle-rimmed imperial plum raptor that used to choke the skies when the cold came and mobbed every branch of every tree during mating season. She could recall the plaintive, beautiful calls that would echo from every inch of Yontzis. Something between velveteen chirp and aggressive caw, the beasts' voices could not be mistaken for anything else in the natural or unnatural world. Even the invasive, lazy and obnoxious Mimidae that made its world imitating the sounds of other fauna and by sneaking into the nests of other birds to destroy those birds' eggs and replace them all with their own could not mimic the Periolis's distinctive chirp screeches that were equal parts warm and intimidating. But the Periolis's and the Mimidae were long gone now. Yonsis was a shadow of what it once was. Those shadows have more substance and depth than those derelict streets and buildings and people that still inhabited the once mighty city. Like the birds, the people would not return. Only the paltry few that were around would live out the lives they were doomed to lead, existing on scraps and slivers and crumbs of the reality that once was. 
Sintana had stayed because she had no other choice. Her mother was hobbled after years of hard work and child rearing. Her father was dead. Her brother had died in the fall. In the wake of the disaster, Sintana's mother, Fionsalik, had died rather quickly. Without adequate medicine, food, or creature comforts that might extend a life, the older woman just couldn't hang on. Sintana did take major consolation in Fionsalik's dying at home with a smile on her face with someone that she loved. That consolation was far from warm on these cold nights of the early summer, and it could not keep her company in the dark hours that were lonelier now that they were utterly silent, devoid of the calls of all the birds and insects and creatures that once were so raucous they would keep the residents of Vionsis up well into evening. It was too cold. It was too dark. It was too quiet. The quiet is what bothered Santana the most. She had never been one to need socialization or idle conversation, but the hum of the natural world is something she had never dreamt would be subtracted from her life. It's the background soundtrack to one's very existence, a part of the core of who and what they are. When that backing track is muted, or in this case deleted, the march of life seems rather empty. Yonsis proper had never been a quiet city to begin with, and it was far from a nature reserve. At all times of day and night, citizens thronged the streets, hawking goods, crying out street food that was piping hot and ready for passers-by, everyone just going about their business and their busy lives. As the capital of Yondrafel, Yonsis was the jewel of the Republic. In truth, though, most of Yondrafel was quite a bit more rural, and true cities were few and far between. Still, Yonsis was civilization incarnate, for better or for worse. Even so, the forests and jungles that were the better part of Yondrafel were not far off. In fact, Sintana's home was on the strange plane of existence that sat straddling both worlds. Her house was on the outskirts of Yonsis proper. Her family's yardlands and other holdings extended into the wilds. That distance from Yonsis is probably what saved her and her mother on that fateful day. What happened was still a mystery. The two women had been sleeping to the buzz of the fauna, as always, mingled with the clatter of the distant city center, when those denizens of the wild went suddenly quiet. Before she knew what was happening, nature had muted, and Yonsis erupted in lamentations of the dying. By the time that Sintana and Vionsalik had fully woken up and become aware enough to check on what was happening outside, the city was already in flames. The orange bath illuminating their home screamed out that destruction was in media race. The immediate response had been to sit on their front porch and add their own wails to those screams echoing out of the Onsis. Kienhap, her brother, had only just gone to work as they bedded down for the evening. He'd begun working overnight shifts in hopes of earning more money for the family and in hopes of someday having enough to get the senatorial dispensation to marry and expand their property even farther into the wildlands. Sintana, once she had recovered from the initial thought, had pushed to escape into the forest, but Fionsalik, being both fatalistic and sickly, had refused to leave their home. She told her daughter that the destruction wouldn't spread that far and that, if it did, she would rather die there amid the happy memories than scared among the trees. But there was no reason to dwell on those three desperate nights and three nightmarish days. Santana looked out to the ruined city. Mourning the dead and traipsing through the past would do her no good. She left the front porch to go around the house and stand on the back porch, changing her vision from blighted cityscape to now thriving jungle. The natural world had rebounded much better than the civilized world. The plant life was thriving just as much as the animal life had seemingly disappeared. The periolis bowers could be seen in the trees, crisped husks still clinging to the trees even after two years of lack of care. 
The crumbling nests looked even more pitiable in the city to Santana. Those birds had brought her and her family such joy in their before lives. She had tried to paint a paralise on the back wall of the family home. She used pigments from plants, berries, and different assortments and combinations of mud and soil. Santana knew that she was going to get it wrong even as she was just beginning. Those birds were just too gorgeous. They defied duplication by a human hand. They were the spirit of her city, of her family, and she just could not get that memory to take visual form. As she stared at the blotchy amalgam of what her memory could put forth, she heard it. Something between Velveteen Chirp and Aggressive Call. Santana's eyes shot to the tree line. There in the paltry few trees that were in their family's yardland proper, where once sheep grazed and persentory fruit fell at waiting canning, said a pair of periolises, seeming to smile at her from across that oh-so-small distance. They coo-screamed, trill sang their unique song, and Santana felt tears begin to fall heavy and fast. If the periolis would return, so too would other birds, other animals, life. Santana mouthed the thank you, fighting through her tears to vocalize it the second time. The two vivid birds both cocking their heads at the address while never ceasing their calls. Santana went back into her home and did the only thing she could think of. She began to clean. It was time to reclaim the husk of her existence and begin to build her own paradise. Thank you for listening to this trio of tales inspired by some former students of mine. All sounds and music you hear come from freesound.org and thefreemusicarchive.com. All of these tunes and all of these sound effects are being used under CC0 1.0 Universal Public Domain Dedication Licenses. Thank you to all artists that contribute to those two communities. I would like to send a special thank you today for helping me reach 200 short stories or short offerings if we're not being too on the nose. I love that many of you have stayed with me from the beginning and I certainly hope that you'll stay with me as we continue ever forward. And that does indeed do it for pros this week. Moving forward here into 2019, please do remember to love those around you, tell them that you do, and embrace this life as it is always stranger than fiction. See you next time.